Probably most of you know me, but there might be a few that don't. My name's Richard, I'm one of the elders here, and we're giving Ray a day off. Well, almost. <laughs> so, this morning we're going to be looking at a section from the book of Philippians, um, and I'll be looking at chapter 2, and we'll read from verses 1 to 4. Mainly I just want to concentrate on verses 2, 3, and 4. So if you've got your Bibles or your tablets or your phones, just... Uh, please do open up to Philippians chapter 2. I'll be reading from the ESV, but you follow along in whichever translation you prefer. So it's Paul writing. This is what he says. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Thus far in God's word, we're going to stop, pray briefly, and then we'll have a look at what it's got for us. Lord, we thank you for this portion of your scriptures. Indeed, we thank you for every bit of scripture. Lord, we just pray that you would open the eyes of our minds as we come before your word. Lord, I pray that uh, people might not hear or remember any things that I say are not right, but only what you would have them know. Lord, I'm not here because I am above anybody else or anything else, Lord. It's just a person showing others what he's found salvation in the name of Jesus and so bless us we pray and we pray it in your name Jesus amen you know this this letter's written and Paul Paul said um, make my joy complete it's a great thing isn't it so I wonder if Ray would write that to us anyway we'll work through it and see what we find have you ever found some great joy in a particular uh, circumstance? Yeah, I, I remember my grandmother did. This is going back, oh, it must be 40 years ago. And uh, she was in her 90s at the time, lived here on the island. And uh, my nephew, my nephew Jack, he was about four at the time, lovely little boy. He came up to, to Grandma and he said, Great Grandma! You're everything a great-grandma should be. <laughs> well, Grandma, she just basked in the joy of this for about ten minutes. Then she turned to him and she said, Jack, what should a great-grandma be? <laughs> and he looked up with his big dark eyes and said, Really old and all shriveled up. <laughs> Now, Grandma was a godly woman. She, she was a real woman of God, and, and she wasn't hurt by this at all, and her joy turned to mirth. She was laughing about that for about the next three days, but she was everything a great-grandma should be, really old and all shriveled up. <laughs> you know, as I said, Paul's writing in the church in Philippi he sets out how the congregation at Philippi can make his joy complete. So what do we know about Philippi? Well, we do know that it was, uh, history tells us, it was made up of Roman citizens, mostly retired military personnel. That's why they'd formed the town of Philippi. So somewhere where these retired military personnel could go and live and see out their days. Located in Macedonia, not mentioned at all in the Old Testament because there was no synagogue there. It wasn't a, uh, it wasn't a Jewish area. And... Uh, so that's what we do know about Philippi. Um, that church was founded by Paul. Uh, you, he did it on his secondary missionary journey along with Silas and Timothy. And uh, you can read about that in Acts 16. He did revisit Philippi. You can read about that in Acts 20. Um, but there's a terrifically strong relationship between Paul and the church. <coughs> Paul's opening remarks of this letter refer to his, their partnership in the gospel. And when you think of that, you think, oh, yeah, we're in partnership with the gospel. 
Yeah, sure, they were receiving and believing the gospel, but it was more for them. For the church at Philippi actually gave financial support to Paul. Now, we usually think of Paul as the tent maker, don't we? The guy who worked his way around the churches and didn't ask for anything. But the Philippians saw it that it was right and proper to give Paul some money. And in fact, he, he touches on this in chapter 4, in the middle of chapter 4. Um, he says, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. What a wonderful relationship that Paul in, enjoyed. It was a great relationship. And, and when he was opening this letter, he says, I always pray for you with joy. And now in 2.2 he says, now this is how you can make my joy complete. I think the principles he set forth are just as important for us on Bribey Island today as they were for Philippi. So let's consider some of these principles and uh, turn to the text a little bit more. The first point I've got this morning is we're called to have the same love and be of one mind. This is how to make your pastor's joy complete. Verse 2 says, Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Same love, full accord of one mind. Your translation might have the word purpose. Having the same purpose, common purpose. Years and years ago, I used to work for a franchise group here on the island. It was a real estate franchise. It was Harcourts. So I'm probably one of the few people here that can actually say, trust me, I'm a salesman. <laughs> <laughs> but we had uh, corporate training, corporate apparel, corporate slogans, corporate advertising, corporate systems. And they weren't there to train the public. They were there to train the workers. And the reason they were there is that the owners of that group knew that if they could get every one of their employees heading in the same direction, they'd make more money. In fact, one of their training videos, which they used extensively, was of a flight of ducks flying along. You've seen them in V formation. And the one out the front would be doing the most work. And the tired ones and sick ones would be hanging off on the ends. Because that's how ducks work. They protect one another. And when the one on the front gets tired, another one will take over, the lead. And so the, the one on the front then gets a bit of a rest. It's the same with cycling when you're drafting along, people who, who've done some cycling. But uh, yeah, they knew if they could get everyone work, working together in the same direction, each helping one another, that that was going to be good for the company. And indeed, I think they, they were very successful. But uh, our oneness doesn't come from being trained up in a corporate method, does it? Our oneness comes from the things God does in our heart. And we, Paul says we're to have the same love. He's not talking about that, that gooey emotion which we get and, and it, you know, the, the, the feelings of love. When we come to the Bible, when the word love is used, it's one of those doing words. It's like a verb. It's an active thing. It's doing things for one another. It's that perfect love of God. And we're told in Romans 5.5 5, that he pours it out into, his, into our hearts. The love of God is, is in the old, old uh, KJV used to say, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. What that really means is that he pours his love into our heart by the power of his spirit, we'd say in modern English. You know, when I think about things like that, I, I struggle because it raises questions in my own life. I love the way that the word challenges us, and challenges me anyway. And I think, do I hunger to know and to serve and to please God? Do I look forward to encouraging and building up others in Christianity and yeah most of the time but I've got to be honest at times I struggle and some days I don't feel like God's love is poured out into my heart and uh, so I struggle along and when I think about it I realize I've moved uh, another pastor many years ago said to me Richard he said 
when you think that, that you're a long way away from God, just contemplate who's moved. Because that's us, isn't it? We're fickle. We have our bad days. Um, and so I know when I get like that, when I'm lacking in love, it's because I've taken my eyes off Jesus. And I've got to seek his forgiveness. And then he restores the love in my heart. See, our one-mindedness should be because he's put his love into us. And we are keeping our eyes on him. We are walking in faith. I'm not really good on Facebook. In fact, I don't particularly like it. I, 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 I'm sorry to all the people who, who enjoy Facebook. But no, I, I struggle with it. But Joan's really good. But um, <laughs> the other day we were sitting in the lounge and the TV was pretty dull. And she said, "Here, listen to this." And she read out a post that was on Facebook and it was written by someone we knew. Which, and we found it really sad. And this person wrote that Christians are not, uh, Christians are, I'm sorry, God is a slave master and Christians are God's slaves. Now, I know there's a, there's a text which refers to a slavehood, but it's not in the context that God is a slave master. See, to me it highlighted a misunderstanding that I think probably quite a few not yet Christians have about our faith. See, we aren't people who, who perform a list of do's and don'ts to win favour with God. Christianity is a love relationship between you and God. God has demonstrated his love to us through Jesus and we desire to show our love for God through obedience to him. In this twofold transaction, he pours his love and his spirit into our life. And it changes the way we think. Changes the way we behave. It gives us an understanding of the purpose of life and progressively grows us to be more like Jesus. See, I find Jesus to be the most compelling figure in all history. When I factor him out, nothing makes sense. Absolutely nothing. I've spoken at many funerals over the years and one of the things that I've tried to explain to people is when they carefully read the scriptures, the things that go wrong in life are all said to be there for us in the scriptures. When we don't walk with God, we cannot expect him to bless us. We cannot expect. We live in a broken world. Because corporately we've left God behind. But for Christians in here... It's different. It's different. Years and years ago, I was on a, a short-term missionary trip up to South Korea. Now, I don't speak any Korean. But that wasn't a disadvantage. In fact, it was a bit of an advantage because I was up there teaching English. And I was teaching English to Korean missionaries who were about to leave, leave Korea to go all over the world as missionaries. And they had to sharpen up their English. But come Sundays, I had the opportunity to visit a whole host of different churches because I was there for some weeks, and um, I found on each occasion a very interesting thing. When I went into the church and not speaking the language, um, I still heard the prayers, but not in the language always that I'd understand, and I still heard the singing, and I recognised the songs. Most, I reckon 90% of what they sang, I could sing along in English. I still recognised the songs. And I recognised the texts that the pastor was teaching from. But I didn't understand the language. Now, being career, of course, many of the churches, they had little earphones or little buds and things you put in your ear, and you just dial whatever language you want. So I want to hear this in Hungarian. You just click a Hungarian and you hear it instantly in Hungarian or French or German or English or Spanish or whatever you want it. They're all there. And so you could listen to it. But the point I'm making, get it translated or not, I found that there was a common denominator between me and my people, and it was a mystery to me. It was something I couldn't tangibly put my finger on. I just knew I was at oneness with all those people. That's the Spirit of God working in my heart and working in the hearts of those around me. And I knew that those people, even though we didn't share a common language, 
We all wanted to know more about Jesus. We all wanted to grow more like Jesus. We all wanted to serve Jesus more. We had the same love and were of one mind. Just like Paul says in verse 2. But Paul continues, and in verse 3 he says, he tells the Christians he wants to show humility, wants us to show humility. He says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. What's ambition? To plan for de or a desire for success? In itself, there's nothing wrong with ambition, as long as your ambitions are within God's plan and are worked out in godly principles. Let me give you an idea. I could have a good ambition, which might say, I want everyone around me to come to an understanding and a belief in the gospel of Jesus. That's, that's a good ambition. It's in accordance with God's God's plan for humanity. Or you could have a, a, a bad ambition. Uh, here's a bad ambition. I want everyone around me to come to understand that I'm the most important person in this world and that I'm number one and you've got to treat me accordingly. Can you see how, how bad that is? Because all it's do doing is drawing attention to yourself, drawing glory away from God, an elevating self. That's a bad an illustration of a, a bad ambition. I had a rather unusual childhood, but that's neither here nor there, but I did spend quite a bit of time living with my grandparents. And I remember on come school holiday time, granddad was a builder, so come school holiday time, if the surf was no good, because I was a keen surfer. I'd get in the work truck with Grandad and we'd go around and inspect all the building sites. And that was good. He had a foreman on each side. He, was, he had quite a big business. And he had a foreman on each side. And we'd go from site to site and check things out. And it, it was a good, good thing to be with Grandad. Anyway, remember on one occasion, we pulled up side, outside a um, high-set house. It was in between Alexandra Headlands and Maroochydore. Um, probably around about Akinja Road, where, if you know the area. But um, this big high, old high set house, it's not there anymore. Granddad ran up the fr front steps, knocked on the door, no answer. Knocked on the door again, still no answer, obviously nobody home. Then he came back down to the ute, lifts up the back canopy off the ute, and big, lifts out this great big box of groceries. Then he went up the back stairs and left them at the top of the the back stairs. I'm just intrigued by this as a lad. When he got back into the car, I said, Grandad, I said, why did you leave him? There's nobody home. Oh, he said, I only knocked on the door to make sure there was nobody home. <laughs> oh, I was even more confused. And I said, well, I don't understand, Grandad. He said, lad, it's like this. He said, that man and lady that live in that house have six children. And he said, he's out of work at the moment and he's a really hard worker, and he's in between jobs looking for work. And he would never accept charity. And he wouldn't want to feel like he owed anybody. So he said, I just wanted to make sure they got the groceries and didn't know where they came from. The principle is the same for us. Whatever we do as Christians, God sees it. God knows what we do, and God knows the motive of our heart. Now, I thank and, and, and really am so thankful that so many people in this church do so many things. But so many people do so many things, I know sometimes the thanks slips through the cracks. And for that, I apologise. I apologise on behalf of the eldership. But rest assured, God knows. When you're doing the little things around the church that maybe nobody else even notices, things just seem to happen, don't they? God sees it. God knows. And rest assured that you will be rewarded. He will recognise that. 
and you don't have to seek recognition, which may lead to selfish ambition. But just keep serving God and to his glory. And Paul tells these people at Philippi, do nothing out of conceit. What's conceit? It's a proud, high opinion of yourself. In fact, some of your translations will even use the word vain. They'll talk about vain conceit, which is even stronger language again. You, you remember this. I'm looking around you. Yeah, yeah, you're the right age. You'll remember this. Here, here's vain conceit. Oh, Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. I can't wait to look in the mirror. I get better looking each day. <laughs> to know me is to love me. You must be a hell of a man. Oh, Lord, it's hard to be humble, but I'm doing the best I can. You see, that was a song that was out years ago, wasn't it? Yes. That is vain conceit. That's what it is. That's it in a nutshell. Paul doesn't stop there, does he? He goes on to our, our third point, a call to place the interests of others alongside our own. Look what he says in, in verse 4. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. It's twofold. They go hand in hand. For the Christian, our responsibility is to both self and to others. Some of the translations even indicate that the others come first. That's why um, the, the first half of the sentence is written in a negative context. Look not only to your own needs. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm not good enough at the Greek to argue it, but some of the writers say that's, that's indicating that the interests of others come first. There was a guy who must have, must have believed that, that the interests of others came first, but he... he must have ignored the first bit. He was a famous 19th century Scottish pastor. Now, I, I'm allowed to quote Scottish pastors. I have a special licence because my surname's MacDougall. <laughs> but he was one of the most powerful, powerful speakers of the time. And he died at 29 years of age. He was totally burned out. He'd, he'd worked himself to death fatigue and not looking after himself. Before he died, he said these words. He was named... Oh, did I tell you his name? He's, oh, well, his name was Rob Murray McShane. Or McShane. So if you ever get a chance, read some of his sermons. McShane. Anyway, he said, The Lord gave me a horse to ride and a message to deliver. Alas, I have killed the horse and cannot deliver the message. So he wasn't talking about his horse. He was talking about his own body. And the message was this, the gospel. But, you know, that was only the physical. Did you notice in our text, in verse 4, it goes way beyond the physical because it says not only to your own interest but to the interest of others. See, that word interest incorporates everything incorporates taking care of physically, mentally, spiritually, and not just yourself, but others around you. Wow, that's quite an ask. And you might say, how could I do that, Richard? I'm glad you asked that question. Um, how about this one? You're wondering how to incorporate this in someone who's maybe a new Christian and not yet Christian or someone that's struggling a little bit. Why not suggest, go for, why don't we go for a walk down the waterfront one morning and stop and have coffee? Think about it. That's not offensive to anybody. That yeah, sounds nice, especially this time of year. Covering a little bit of physical, if you're able. You're certainly covering mental, because you're chatting. But you stop for the coffee and you have a chat and you say, how's life going? Anything I can pray for you about? And so you've introduced the spiritual. OK, let's summarise so far. And, yeah, 
I'll draw it to a close shortly, but I want to just summarise where we're at and then we'll look at some closure on it. Verse 2, Christians are to be like-minded. Verse 3, Christians are to be humble in their thoughts and actions. Verse 4, Christians are to care for one another as well as themselves. Who lived in the town of Philippi? Revision. Retired military. Now, I have a theory on this. I, I, this is not... This, this is from the book of McDougall. It's not from the Bible. i got a theory. I think that people who've had military training or also high corporate training, Wayne will know what I'm talking about here perhaps, they understand this already. You see, in the military, you need, the, you need to have like-mindedness because of your military training. They understand humility and thought and action because they've learned to be submissive to those in authority. They understand how to care for one another because they are soldiers and that's how you survive. So when Paul instructed them, he was calling them to put into Christian action principles they already understood. Now, I know that some of you have a, a military background and others of you have a corporate background where some of these principles you'll already understand through the world. But for many of us, for many of us, these things are almost alien. Even though we read them in the Bible, we think, oh, yeah, that, that's logical enough. I can, I can follow that. But let's think about it a little bit deeper. Think about being like-minded, verse 2. What is the sort of thing you hear in the world when it all boils down? Have you ever heard things like saying, well, we're all individuals. We're capable of deciding for ourselves what is right and wrong, and what is right for you might not be right for me, and what is wrong for you might not be wrong for me. Have you ever heard that? That's what the world's teaching. And we know, we know, particularly the older ones here can tell you, society is decaying. Each person is doing what they think is right in their own eyes, like you read about in the book of Judges. And corporately, so much of our society is moving further and further from God. And we see it in all things. Talk to any old person here in the, in the congregation. No, there's no old people, is there? Oh, well, just, just some of the most... Thanks. Thanks a lot. The older ones. Yeah, talk to some of the older ones, some, some that are older than you, and ask them if you used to lock up the house or lock up the car when you when they were kids. See, corporately we're moving away as, as we move further and further from God. And there is less and less like-mindedness in society. Because people are becoming less and less like Jesus. And verse 3 where it says, be humble in thoughts and actions. What's the world teach us about that today? I'll tell you what it teaches. It teaches to be humble is to be weak. Evolution, which is taught in most of our schools, it demands survival of the fittest. That's what it's based on. It is rubbish. You're quite right, John. It's absolute rubbish. But this is what is taught. So individuals put themselves first. See, there's, there's this social, social underlying premise that you'll get out of life what you take for yourself. First time I ever saw a Winnebago, it was across the road from where I worked, and there was a body shop there. And come lunchtime, I wandered over, because I'd never seen one of these things, I'd heard about them, and uh, I wandered over, this is years ago, I wandered over so I could have a look at this Winnebago. And inside there was a sign. It says, said, he who dies with the most toys wins. That's our society. Grasp what you can for yourself and be proud of it. What about verse 4, where we're told to care for one another? What's the world teach you? The world teaches you are number one. Always put yourself first, because if you don't, no one else will. Look after yourself, or you will get trampled. You hear things like, the world looks after those who look after themselves. 
Yeah, sure, be kind to one another if you can, but not at the expense of your own well-being. Can you see how diabolically opposed what Paul is teaching to what much of society feeds us today? And I confess that for me, I have to be so careful because I can become so indoctrinated in the sinful teaching of this world that I find a temptation to partly embrace some of it. And I probably, if you're honest with yourself, you'll have had times when you've experienced the same thing. It's little wonder that in Matthew 19, Jesus himself told us, he who is first will be last, and he who is last will be first. And as we think about these things in society, you realise this is just so true. So I guess the, the final challenge is, because I've just gone time, are we willing to strive towards joy in this church? I think we are. I see it happening. But the call is for us to be like-minded. The call is for us to be humble in thought and action. And the call is for us to care for those around us without neglecting ourselves. You know, we do these things, we become more like Jesus. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Okay, let's stop. We're going to pray.